And I suppose that if we really take Jung's concept of the collective unconscious as a reality, there is a certain resonant field that happens when large numbers of people are thinking the same thing. That that alone creates a subtle loss of individual identity in that moment. Uh, particularly in today's polarizing world, for whatever reason, we're tending to get our identities through our political parties. They become more and more important in terms of our sense of who we are and who we aren't. And it actually doesn't even matter what the policies are. If the policy flips 180 degrees over, the most important thing is to align with the party. It doesn't matter what the policy is. And maybe that's the most scary thing about cultural complexes is that we fall subject to groupthink on both the Republican side and the Democratic side. I think it's an accomplishment to be able to embrace the other. I think in some ways the most natural thing is to feel comfortable with your own kind, whatever that own kind is. Uh, if we're Jewish, if we're black, if we're Christian, if we're uh, uh, Asian, whatever. I I'm doing these big categories, but I think the most natural thing is for people to link with, marry with, and identify with the people who are like them. I don't think that's unnatural. I think it's natural. And I think it's experienced as threatening to move outside of that. I think it goes against uh, I won't call it an instinct per se, but I think to be able to embrace and include the other is a developmental accomplishment. It's a huge accomplishment um, and one that is indicative, I think, of maturity. And not only is it a, an accomplishment as we uh, live you know, in the world uh, out there in a material way, but it's an accomplishment internally from a Jungian perspective of how do we recognize and work with our own shadows? In other words, do we have an internal democracy or do we have an authoritarian um, internal structure of rulership of things that are good, that are bad? Um, we just don't deal with our shadows. Uh, Etc. In in an attempt at at control and staving off what we fear might be chaos and just the wish to believe we're all really good people. So what I'm hearing Deb, there is that yes, in the individual psyche, but if we lean into what Tom is saying, that that same agenda could exist in a large group. Yes. Again, this idea of evac a group can evacuate their own shadow and then find other groups to reject that onto, that we're all participating in it in a collective way. But it is more than an individual uh, thing, which is what makes it so powerful and also so sobering. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Don Kalshed, I'm sure you're familiar with Don's work, and maybe he's been on your show before. But yes. Don has, has written some lovely papers on this notion of the inner democracy versus kind of an inner totalitarianism. And I think from that introverted Jungian perspective, it's a, it's a wonderful contribution that he's made, very similar to the, to the point that you're making, Deb, that there's an inner reality to how these structures exist inside of us as individuals, and then also how they exist inside of us as groups. And uh, particularly in today's polariz polarizing world, we, it, for whatever reason, we're tending to get our identities through our political parties. They become more important, more and more important, in terms of our sense of who we are and who we aren't. It used to be that you could, you know, well, we, we might have all had political affiliations, but the intensity of identification with the different parties as being who we are. And it actually doesn't even matter what the policies are. If the policy flips 180 degrees over, the most important thing is to align with the party. It doesn't matter what the policy is. It's the identification with the party. It's a very dangerous phenomena because it, it, it 
stops us from thinking as individuals with our own ideas and perceptions. It, it, it creates a group think. And, and maybe that's the most scary thing about cultural complexes is that we fall subject to group think on both the Republican side and the Democratic side. We just fall into group think. And it's kind of terrifying, actually. It, it, it's, it's mind-numbing. And it's what uh, Christopher Hedges in, in 2008, he wrote a book. He called it the, uh, the Empire of Illusion. The end of literacy and the triumph of spectacle. The empire of illusion, the end of literacy and the triumph of spectacle. We, we've been reduced to these kinds of ways of thinking, and, and this is where the issue of truth becomes so important. Uh, the, the empire of illusion really means that what's real or true or untrue actually doesn't matter. What matters is how you spin your idea of what's important. And once we give up our fundamental notions of what's real and true, we're in great danger as a people. Yeah. So that uh, takes me to what are the standards for, for thinking rather than picking up on memes and stuff on social media and you know, all the diverse channels of information of, you know, what, what are the standards for how we think about something, where we go for our facts rather than uh, the triumph of, of spectacle, the triumph of a clever idea, the triumph of something that's exciting. Well, that's a, that's a great question. The first thought that comes to mind is that the first standard that is required for thinking is time. And because our experience of time has gotten so foreshortened in terms of our attention spans, in terms of our ability to listen and concentrate, listen to one another, exchange ideas, maybe that's why podcasts have become so popular as kind of a compensation for the fact that our attention spans have become so limited, you can't think unless you have time and space to think. <laughs> that's, the, that's the very first criteria. And then you're lucky if you have a thought but, or an original thought, but, but um, everything's so compressed. And, and it also creates a kind of eternal now in terms of the... Inf we're always receiving some new information about a new storm or a new this or a new that, that we simply lurch from one event to the next. And we can't remember a month later what happened because it's so compressed and condensed. So I think our, this is where I think we're suffering enormously from the so-called benefits of our technology uh, is that, that we're being, uh, our capacity to think is being foreshortened by the rapidity with which we're bombarded with information. Well, it seems also that technology, social media particularly, is enhancing that feeling of being a collective entity. It tricks us into thinking we're having an independent one-on-one -on -one conversation with our phone, but because that one-on-one -on -one conversation is also happening to one million other people, we're always being pulled into these experiences of a collective moment, a collective idea, a collective image. And I suppose that if we really take Jung's concept of the collective unconscious as a reality, there is, there is a certain resonant field that happens when large numbers of people are thinking the same thing regarding the same image, that that alone creates a subtle field of an excessive amount of, or, or a loss of individual identity in that moment. And that's in that very non-rational layer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I know, go ahead, Deb. No, I'm thinking what an interesting point you're raising, Joseph, of that if you're alone in a room with your phone 
it feels like I am having a, a personal private moment of interacting, learning, reading, absorbing something. But in reality, there are millions of people out there uh, being influenced. So we get seduced uh, into thinking that we're uh, doing something independently when, in fact, we're uh, being lured into a reality that someone else has created uh, and is shared by millions of people. Yes, I guess uh, extracting to the notion of a cultural complex, we could say that our evolving, almost daily evolving relationship to technology with AI emerging is itself a cultural complex, the implications of which we really don't know. It's the new frontier and how it's going to alter how we think, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others, how we relate to the world is going to be markedly, dramatically shifted in ways that we really don't understand. And that that would be, a, a, it's a dangerous cultural complex, I think. I don't, I don't look forward to it. <laughs>